Well, blessed Sunday to you as we come on this fifth Sunday after Pentecost. It is also, for many of us in America, of course, the 4th of July weekend, although it is uh, celebrated more in the week, but uh, we still remember the sacrifice of our patriots for freedom and democracy around the world. We'll kind of touch on that a little bit in the sermon today, but we are concluding our section in Matthew 10 which is considered the Exodus teaching, the sending out of the apostles to make a difference. And so we ask the question, what is the reward of following God, following Jesus specifically? What are the rewards of receiving those who are not just sent out from Jesus, but ambassadors of the very person? An ambassador is not just a person from a country, they represent the country. And so we as believers, the apostles as persons, represented Jesus to the places that they went. We're going to hear a little bit of what that means in our passage today. But let us begin with a moment to turn our hearts toward God and to remind ourselves that we indeed have our sins forgiven in the cross of Jesus Christ. And so we begin our service in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. In the presence of God, who sees our hearts and our minds, let us confess our faith. God, our strength, we confess that we are captive to the power of sin that dwells within us. We put ourselves first and others last. What we think will make us happy leaves us longing for more. Even when we want to do what is good, we find ourselves doing the opposite. Rescue us from death's grip in our lives. Raise us up day by day, that we may be alive to God in Christ Jesus. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his son to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins as a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare unto you the entire forgiveness of your sins. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you join with me in prayer? O God, you direct our lives by your grace, and your words of justice and mercy reshape the world. Mold us into a people who welcome your word and serve one another. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our first reading comes from the prophet Jeremiah, the 28th chapter. A little segment that is prominent in Jeremiah's life. Israel, or should I say Judah specifically, had had most of its leaders taken away into exile to Babylon and also had the uh, in, uh, the interior uh, objects of the temple taken away too. Let's say that Judah was gutted. And there was a challenge. Should we remain loyal as Judah people and trust that God will rescue Judah from the take over of Babylon? Should we ally with Egypt, who will keep us independent and fight against Babylon? Or should we view this as a punishment for the sins of Judah? Hosanna, one of the prophets, took one position, and Jeremiah took another position. I mispronounced his name, Hananiah. Now, you'll notice that there is a book of Jeremiah and there is not a book of Hananiah. So, for the people of Israel, they had to decide which prophet should we welcome. The prophet Jeremiah says in verse 5 of chapter 28, the prophet Jeremiah spoke to the prophet Hananiah in the presence of the priests and all the people who were standing in the house of the Lord. And the prophet Jeremiah said, Amen. May the Lord do so. May the Lord fulfill the words that you have prophesied and bring back 
to this place from Babylon, the vessels of the house of the Lord, and all the exiles. But Jeremiah continues, But listen now to this word that I speak in your hearing, and in the hearing of all the people. The prophets who preceded you and me from ancient time prophesied war, famine, and pestilence against many countries and great nations. As for the prophet who prophesies peace, when the word of that prophet comes true, then it will be known that the Lord has truly sent the prophet. This is the word of the Lord. Our next verse comes from Romans 6, beginning with verse 12. Paul speaks and continues to speak from last week on the power of sin. Do not let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. No longer present your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you do not are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Should we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey? either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you, having once been slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the form of teaching to which you were entrusted, and that you, having been free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to greater and greater iniquity, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness for sanctification. When you were slaves of sin, you were free to regard in regard to righteousness. So that what advantage did you have then when you get from the things which you now are ashamed? The end of those things is death. But now you have been freed from sin and enslaved to God. The advantage you get is sanctification. The end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Here ends our reading, the word of the Lord. And our gospel today comes from Matthew, the 10th chapter beginning with verse 40. Jesus said to the twelve as he continued to speak, Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of the prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives a cup of cold water to the one of these little ones in the name of the disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. Here ends our gospel, the gospel of the Lord. As we have considered these verses today, there is one question that is presented to us, I believe, in all three of our readings today. And it is the question to ask, what is the reward for being righteous, at least as a Christian believer? Paul is very direct. It is the free gift of God in Christ Jesus for eternal life. And I dare say that that's probably why most of us maybe go to church sometimes, is because it is where we find eternity. 
anchored in the study, if not the call, the promises of the good news that God has freed us in Christ Jesus. But what if we weren't sure if that was good news? What if we were challenged by whether it was a lie or not? I am not saying that I am reconsidering my faith right now. I am not. But there are times, maybe times of doubt, times where life isn't going as we expected it to go, or maybe when we are challenged by circumstances. It can be our own actions. It can be sin that lies deep within us, or it can be outright persecution to the message that we believe God has called us to speak and the world around us does not want to receive it, such as the case of Jeremiah in our first reading today. And so in those circumstances, we might ask, what is the reward of either being sent out for right before this passage in Matthew 10, you can read the circumstances Jesus for sure, calls out 12 apostles, sent out ones, to represent the new Israel, to bring them back so that they would be sheep with a new shepherd, that they'd be healed and of various diseases, they would be brought back to the sheepfold. But those who were in leadership, and even a majority of those who represented Israel did not seem to receive the message. Was there great reward in following it? And for those that did receive with a welcome mat, these apostles, was there any reward for them? Some of them were kicked out of their fellowship, they were kicked out of their family. There was great division that happened within and without. Former friends refused to talk with one another. And there was, for this great price of freedom, great division. Now, I think Jesus is dealing with three types of rewards. And he is going to stress the third of these types. The first, as we have illustrated, is probably the reward of a prophet. A prophet can be assured that God is speaking to them. The prophet can be assured that even as there is opposition to what he or she is saying, they are in the truth, no matter what the outside world will say. But there is a danger in being this type of prophet. You are putting all your eggs in the truth that you are rightly discerning, if not speaking, the word of God. And that not always will you find physical, or should I say, this side of eternity, shelter. You will be persecuted, if not sometimes even tortured and killed, as many prophets of the past, present, and when the future, Lord willing, will probably be. But you could be, with your reward, the knowledge to know that you were right in the end, such as Jeremiah, who was persecuted as the weeping prophet throughout his life, went against Hananiah, the other prophet of peace and prosperity for Judah, Hananiah, who died rather quickly, and Jeremiah, who was raised up and became part of Scripture, fulfilling Deuteronomy 18, where a prophet from God is true, and a false prophet will be known by their fruits. You know, this is not necessarily the reward that Jesus is talking about. There's also the reward of being righteous, as many of the Pharisees and Sadducees tried to be in following the law of God, as many good and faithful Christians tried to be by reading and rereading not just the law of God, but also Jesus' interpretation of the law of God found on the Sermon on the Mount, making sure that we are 
rightly discerning what God wants us to do. And there's nothing wrong with it until we realize that the law of God, while it shows us the right way and right disposition we are to have, is more so a law that convicts us and shows us as a mirror that we are sinners, that we have not fulfilled all of the law. When Jesus would talk to a Pharisee and a Sadducee, he'd say, you have already thought that because you didn't act on it, you have not committed adultery. But guess what? You are already committing adultery in your heart. We might even think that we have been done good because we have not acted on our viciousness toward someone who is near us, maybe a neighbor or someone we dislike. And Jesus said, if you're already thinking about it, you have already sinned. And so we can at least look good, maybe get some rewards as being an honest, if not ethical, broker in this world. But we will know deep down in our hearts that while we may look righteous, we still, by our own actions, fall short of the glory of God. But Jesus says there is a third type of righteousness, and it's one of being a small child. And that's the type of righteousness and reward that he illustrates throughout this gospel, specifically Matthew. In another teaching section, Matthew 18, the disciples were wanting to know, how are we to be great as disciples of you, Lord? And so there was a discussion between James and John. At that time, it says in Matthew 18:1. The disciples came to Jesus and asked him, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he called a child, or what we have in our Greek passage in our present gospel, a little one, whom he put among them and said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like this little one, like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever becomes humble like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever welcomes such child in my name welcomes me. You see the connection to our gospel today? He is calling the disciples to be like children, vulnerable, learning, but yet trusting in the promise that they have a great inheritance as sons and daughters of God as brothers and sisters in Christ called to serve in a very treacherous world. And it is incumbent upon the people that they visit that they welcome such one as these. Sometimes we hear good stories of a vulnerable adult or child that is welcomed in some very dangerous circumstances, and sometimes is adopted into a new family, a new place. Tragically, other times, we might hear the opposite of that story, but the kingdom reward is based on how one receives such a one. And Jesus warns in verse 6 of chapter 18, if anyone puts a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better to have a great millstone fastened around their neck and you were drowned in the depths of the sea. You see, there is reward for welcoming such a one. In another great teaching station, probably most familiar to you, is the parable of the sheep and the goats, Matthew 25, where Jesus says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne and all the nations. You see, it's not just the disciples here. It's not just Israel here. It's all the people of the world will be judged by the standards. They gathered 
and he who would separate one from another as a shepherd separates sheep and goats. Now, to be truthful, sheep and goats were usually mixed together. It was considered legal in Exodus to offer at Passover either a goat or a sheep. They were interchangeable. But the Lord has a discernment here. And he tells who the children are, the righteous ones, the prophetic ones. He says, the king will say at his right hand, come, you are blessed of my father and inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. For truly, he says, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. You see, being an ambassador goes two ways. We represent Christ, but we are also called to be received as Christ would be received. And sometimes that will mean the accusation that we'll be called Beelzebul, Lord of the Flies, as Jesus warned previously, but it also means that we will truly see where the righteousness, the true righteousness, not the false, the true prophecy, not the false prophecy, will take place in the kingdom of God. What does this mean on the 4th of July? Of course, at the 4th of July, we celebrate our political freedom from tyranny. Many of the patriots use the example of Exodus, envisioning George III as a tyrant, and themselves as slaves under this monarchy, and therefore declared a new nation. Now, I must remind you, not every devout Christian accepted this argument. One of the most prominent preachers of the day did not. That was John and Charles Wesley, who always remained loyal to King George. But their associates in America, who took on the teaching of Wesley, Coke and Asbury, they did not. And they were willing to sacrifice themselves for the message and not get caught up in the politics of it because they were about one thing, making sure that they welcomed the poor, the needy, those who needed to hear the gospel and organize themselves as children of God. Of course, when it was preached in this country, we had the contradiction of having political freedom for some and not for others. And so there was the challenge of slavery. And once again, the message of Exodus, the message of being set free, was being sent to another population, boldly and eloquently spoken by Frederick Douglass in 1852 in his Famous, what does a slave have to say about the 4th of July? And so today, we are called as nations, we might disagree on how, but we are called to spread democracy in the world. We are called to set people free. It is the calling of a nation, and yes, we have failed and continue to fail miserably, but we are still called to that higher calling. And if we keep our eyes on that focus, we too may, and that's the big word, may, receive the word of the child. Not of the prophet, not of the righteous one, but of the child. And what does Jesus say about that reward? The person in the name of the righteous person will receive a reward of cup of cold water. One of these who, little ones who has welcomed my disciple. Truly, I tell you, none of you will lose your reward. We may fail from it. We may betray it sometimes and we may deny it. But we are called to a freedom a freedom that has been won, a freedom as a child of God, set free, as Paul says, 
no longer a slave to the messages of this world, but slave to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Free like Jeremiah was, even as he was persecuted, and yes, even died for the sake of his message. But he knew that it needed to be anchored in truth and not in illusion. It needed to be anchored in truth and not just popular patriotism that just wanted to affirm the temple and being a patriarch Judaite rather than being on the side of God. Those are difficult, if not sometimes life-changing decisions, but they call us to a higher purpose. And may God call us to that reward today. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the freedom you have won for us in the gospel of Jesus Christ. May we not just receive the reward of the righteous or the prophet, but more importantly, the reward of the children of God. And may we discern who are the true children of God and welcome them in our midst, minister to them, encourage them, and give them our grace and foundation. Lord, be with us on these journeys of faith this week. As we celebrate our political freedom, may we celebrate our spiritual freedom this day. All these things we ask in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray so long ago. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Psalm 89, 1-4, 15-18 through 18. Your love, O Lord, forever will I sing. From age to age my mouth will proclaim your faithfulness. For I am persecuted... Persuaded, I'm sorry, that your steadfast love is established forever, and you have set your faithfulness firmly in the heavens. I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn an oath to David, my servant. I will establish your line forever and preserve your throne for all generations. Verse 15. Happy are the people who know the festal shout. They walk, O Lord, in the light of your presence. They rejoice daily in your name. They are jubilant in your righteousness. For you are the glory of their strength, and by your favor our might is exalted. Truly our shield belongs to the Lord, our King, to the Holy One of Israel. This, of course, is the promise given to David's line fulfilled in Jesus Christ the son of David, who now grants you and I sonship and daughtership, should I say, to become children of God. And may we walk in that reward and in that blessing today, no matter what rages within and without. Let us follow the good news. And so may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you today. We trust that these continue to be words of encouragement. Happy 4th of July. And may we celebrate not just our political freedom, but the freedom that we have in the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Take care. God bless.